Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani. For this lesson, we will explore the circulatory system. In the introductory lesson to this unit, I talked about 10 different systems in the human body. And although all of these have unique functions to play in keeping us alive, they do not always do so independent of each other. The circulatory system is one system whose function is particularly tied to all other systems in the body. For example, it interacts with the respiratory system by delivering oxygen gas from the lungs to all body cells and by removing carbon dioxide gas from those same cells and delivering them to the lungs for removal by exhalation. It also interacts with our digestive system by transferring nutrients from the villi in the small intestine to all of our cells. It interacts with our endocrine system by transporting the hormones produced by glands to the cells that need them. It plays a role in our excretory system by removing waste products from our cells delivering them to the liver for detoxification, and then to the kidneys for removal out of the body. And this is just a small example of some of the functions of the circulatory system that are very closely tied to other systems. Another function of our circulatory system is the role that it plays in controlling temperature regulation. And that is because our blood can deliver heat throughout the body, from the core or inside of the body, to the surface and vice versa. So by adjusting how much blood can flow to the skin, the body can control how much body heat can be lost to our surroundings and how much body heat is conserved. The circulatory system has three main components, which will be the focus of this lesson. First, there is a fluid. In the case of vertebrates like us, this fluid is called blood. Then there are the blood vessels through which this fluid can flow. We will focus on the differences between arteries, veins, and capillaries. And third, there is a pump, the heart, which keeps the blood constantly flowing and moving through those vessels. We will start by taking a closer look at the composition and function of blood. Blood is the fluid medium through which we transport nutrients, waste, gases, and many other molecules throughout the body. The average adult should have about 4.5 to 5.7 liters of blood in their body. However, this amount can vary. This average is for adults weighing between 150 to 180 pounds. So adults who weigh less than that, and of course children, will have less blood. On the other hand, that amount can be higher for people who are pregnant. 55% of our blood is made up of a liquid substance called plasma. Blood plasma is a light, amber-colored liquid component of blood without any blood cells. It is mostly water, but also carries the cell proteins and ions and other small solutes. Most of the other 45% of our blood is made up of erythrocytes, which is just a fancy word for red blood cells. And I know that 45% and 55% adds up to 100 already, but those values are rounded up since the last component, called the buffy coat, makes up less than 1%. The word buffy coat refers to the white layer between the red blood cells and plasma that forms in the unit of whole blood after it has been spun in a centrifuge. The buffy coat mostly contains white blood cells, the soldiers of the immune system, and platelets. And most of these blood components, the blood cells, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets, are actually made inside our bones in a soft, spongy area called the bone marrow. Let's start by looking at red blood cells, or erythrocytes, a little bit closer. Red blood cells have a very important function. They carry fresh oxygen all over the body. This oxygen is needed by our body cells to make energy via a process called cellular respiration. And this is what makes oxygen so important. Without oxygen, our cells cannot make energy. And without energy, our cells will die. Now, blood always has some oxygen in it. However, there are times when red blood cells are carrying more oxygen, like when they just picked up a bunch of oxygen at the lungs. We call this blood oxygenated blood. When the blood has less oxygen, like when it's returning to the heart after delivering oxygen to the body cells, we call it deoxygenated blood. And even though red blood cells, and therefore blood is always red, Oxygenated blood is a brighter red than deoxygenated blood. Red blood cells are made mostly of hemoglobin, a protein that has iron as part of its structure and whose function is to carry oxygen. 
And red blood cells have a very distinctive biconcave shape, kind of looking like a flat disc. This shape is actually important because it gives red blood cells the flexibility to fit through the tiniest of blood vessels, often moving through tiny capillaries single file. Issues with our red blood cell production can result in a medical condition known as anemia. Anemia happens when you do not have enough red blood cells or when your red blood cells do not function properly. Since red blood cells carry oxygen to cells and since oxygen is needed for energy production, a typical sign and symptom of anemia is extreme fatigue and a lack of energy. White blood cells are also called leukocytes. These are the cells of the immune system that protect our bodies from foreign invaders and other diseases. They flow through our bloodstream to fight viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens that threaten our health. So an increase in the number of white blood cells in our blood is often a sign that our body is fighting an infection. Platelets, or thrombocytes, are not actually whole cells. They are fragments of special cells that are found in the bone marrow. Platelets play a role in wound healing. The primary function is to prevent and stop bleeding. If a blood vessel is damaged, the body sends signals to platelets, which cause them to travel to the injured area. Once the platelets arrive at the site, they clump together and release clotting factors to help form a blood clot that will help stop bleeding. Now that we've learned a little bit more about blood, let's take a look at the different types of blood vessels through which this blood can flow. Let's start with arteries. Arteries are muscular blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. They mostly carry oxygenated blood, but can also carry deoxygenated blood. They are defined not by the type of blood they carry, but by the direction of that flow, which is away from the heart. Because arteries carry blood away from the heart, they have a thick elastic wall that consists of three muscle layers. And that is because blood pressure is very high in arteries. So the artery walls are thick and elastic, so that when the blood enters under pressure, the walls can expand. In contrast, veins carry blood towards the heart, mostly the oxygenated blood that is coming from the body to the heart, but sometimes oxygenated blood if it is traveling to the heart from the lungs. Because it takes longer for blood to travel back to the heart, most of our blood, about 70% of it at any given time, is found within the venous system. Like arteries, the outer walls of veins also have three layers. However, they are much thinner with a lot less smooth muscle. Since the blood traveling through our veins have very low blood pressure, they need the help of the movement of our muscles to help squeeze the veins and help bring blood back to the heart. Most veins also have one-way valves called venous valves, that prevent the backflow of blood caused by gravity. This allows blood in veins to flow only in one direction, which is towards the heart. However, if a person is standing still for very long periods of time or is bedridden, blood can accumulate in veins, and sometimes the walls of the veins become stretched and lose their elasticity, causing the valves to weaken, which is the cause of a condition called varicose veins. As blood flows from arteries to veins, there are other smaller blood vessels like arterioles and venules, but the smallest are called capillaries. Capillaries are the thinnest of a body's vessels. The walls of capillaries are composed of a single layer of cells. This layer is so thin that molecules like gases, water, and lipids can pass right through them by diffusion and enter the tissues. And capillaries must interact very closely with all our body tissues. If a body tissue does not get any blood delivered, the cells within it will die. So capillaries make up a total surface area of about 6,300 square meters of blood vessels. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about the last component, the heart. The heart is the life-giving, ever-beating muscle in our chest. The heart is responsible for pumping blood from our body to the lungs, and blood from our lungs back to the rest of the body. The heart for the average human will contract about 3 billion times, never resting, never stopping to take a break except for a fraction of a second between beats. At 80 years of age, a person's heart will continue to beat an average of 100,000 times a day. It is about the size of your fist, and it is a hollow muscular pump made of cardiac muscle that keeps blood circulating properly. On the inside, the heart has four chambers. It is divided into the left and right side by a wall called the septum. The two upper chambers are called atria. 
Atria receive blood from the veins and have thin walls since they don't have to pump blood very far. When the atria contract, they move the blood a very short distance within the heart, just down to the ventricles that are right below them. The ventricles are the lower chambers of the heart. They are responsible for pumping blood out of the heart into arteries. They have thick muscular walls, much thicker than the atria, because they generate much higher blood pressures when they contract. And actually, the left ventricle has even thicker walls than the right ventricle because it needs to pump blood to most of the body, while the right ventricle pumps blood only towards the lungs. So let's take a look at how blood flows in and out of the heart in more detail. So this is a diagram of the heart, and you see a lot of different structures that are labeled, which we will go through one at a time in a minute. But you will also see both red and blue arrows that show the direction that blood flows. The red arrows will indicate the flow of oxygenated blood, and the blue arrows will indicate the flow of deoxygenated blood. One way to look at it that might help is to think of the four chambers of the heart like rooms in a home. Two are on the right side of the heart, the right atrium and the right ventricle, and two are on the left side, the left atrium and the left ventricle. Now blood is flowing through all four chambers all the time. But to make it easier, we will look at how blood flows through the heart sequentially, starting from when it enters the right atrium. So, like returning home after a long day at work, your blood returns to your heart after circulating through your body. It enters your right atrium via two main arteries, the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. They bring blood from the upper and lower parts of the body, respectively. This deoxygenated blood then flows directly into the right ventricle. It's like when you enter your living room and immediately keep going to your kitchen to grab a bite to eat. From your right ventricle, your blood can't immediately go to the two chambers on the left side of your heart. It first needs to make a pit stop at your lungs to get rid of carbon dioxide and pick up oxygen. So it leaves your right ventricle through pulmonary arteries and goes to the lungs. After leaving the lungs, your newly oxygenated blood returns to your heart via the left and right pulmonary veins and enters the left atrium. From there, it flows into your left ventricle. Your left ventricle then pumps this blood out of your body through the aorta. The blood then flows through arteries and capillaries to all body tissues, where it makes the rounds delivering oxygen, nutrients, and other molecules, and picking up carbon dioxide and other waste, before returning through the veins to the heart and starting the process all over again. But also, like rooms in your house, your heart chambers have doors. These doors are your heart valves, and they open and close to manage blood flow and keep blood moving in the proper direction. You have four main heart valves. The tricuspid valve connects your right atrium and your right ventricle. The mitral valve connects your left atrium and left ventricle. The pulmonary valve connects your right ventricle and main pulmonary artery and your aortic valve connects your left ventricle and aorta. In this image, you can see the valves closing every time the heart pumps. They close so forcefully every time your heart pumps that they make a noise. That noise is the noise of your heart beating, often called the lub dub sound. So getting back to our house analogy, imagine that every time you leave a room, you slam the doors rather than closing them gently. That's how our valves work. Their role is to prevent blood from flowing back to where it came from and to keep it flowing in the right direction. As you can see, the movement of blood through the body, heart, and lungs has many steps. Here I have added a mnemonic device that can help you remember those steps in order. There are three different types of circulation or circuits in the body. One is called a pulmonary circuit. The word pulmonary refers to the lungs, so this part of the circulation carries oxygen-depleted blood away from the heart to the lungs, and then oxygen-rich blood from the lungs back to the heart. Then there's the systemic circuit. This is the part that carries oxygenated blood away from the heart into other parts of the body, and also carries the oxygenated blood from the body back to the heart. But there is a third circuit. It is called the coronary circuit. This type of circulation provides the heart itself with oxygenated blood so it can function properly. 
After all, the heart is a big muscle, and it needs a lot of oxygen to continue to work. Interruptions of coronary circulation can be dangerous and can cause heart attacks. This happens when the heart muscle is damaged because it cannot get enough oxygen. And so that's it for this lesson. There's a lot more we could cover about the heart, such as the electrical activity of the heart, the cardiac cycle, and blood pressure. But those are topics for another lesson. Talk to you soon.